Hello and welcome to this masterclass in wallpaper decoration. I'm Carl Ashby and I'm going to show you today not only how to wallpaper but more importantly why we do the things that we do. That way, armed with this additional knowledge and deeper understanding, you too will get the very best out of wall coverings, both for yourself in a professional way and of course, more importantly, for your client. We'll take you through the stages with our own master craftsman Adam, who himself uses only the highest quality of wall coverings and has decorated some of the most prestigious properties in Britain. And we'll also show you with our untrained amateur some of the most common pitfalls and mistakes that can occur whilst wallpapering. So where do we begin? Well, the wallpapers here at Anstey Wall Coverings are manufactured to the highest attainable standards using very proud traditional manufacturing craftsmanship and as such warrant the very best of preparation, adhesion and workmanship. We will identify that wallpaper is, in practical terms, a very simple product to use and that most queries related to finished decoration is not a wallpaper issue at all but normally one of application. This training film is about the technical aspects relating to the hanging of wallpapers. Ultimately, we'll identify and respect the mutual relationship between the wallpaper, adhesive and wall preparation, regardless of which type of paper is used. So what are paste-the-wall wallpapers, often referred to as non-wovens, and how do they differ from conventional paper? Well, in one regard, of course, they don't differ at all, in that they both equally add to the beauty of a room. It's the subtle difference in the paper construction which now changes the way that these papers can be used. For purposes of understanding, we'll take a look at how conventional paper is constructed. Paper is wood, simple. More specifically, it is made up of tiny hollow fibres that look and work like little grains of rice, all essentially lying in the same direction as paper is made. Paper is a very simple product in that it expands in the width when you apply moisture and looks to contract back to its original size as that moisture is taken away. These rough-sided paper fibres lay side by side, tightly knitted together and held in situ by a glue-like substance which further locks them up. Paper can be made from a variety of species of wood and it is this mix that determines a particular paper's characteristics. This expansion takes place because we apply adhesive and it can be anything between 4 to 10 millimetres, taking around 5 to 7 minutes to complete the process. A typical width paper may expand up to 7 millimetres when fully soaked out. Expansion occurs as fibres gorge themselves on the available moisture, swelling up in the process until such time as they're full, and then the expansion stops. Now the construction of non-woven is essentially the same, with the addition of one important element, polyester. Polyester used in paper making is a long water resistant fibre and there are masses of them interwoven into the paper sheet. They principally work by weaving through the paper fibres and confine them so much that no matter how much they try and gorge themselves with water, they simply can't expand and therefore, unlike conventional paper, it doesn't require a soak time. Additional to non-wovens and papers, we have vinyl wall coverings. Vinyl wall coverings are papers with PVC layer on the front of them, which make them particularly useful where there may be high humidity in a room. Vinyls can be backed with either conventional paper or non-woven. As such, for hanging purposes, you'd follow the appropriate instructions as laid out on the label. Now that we understand a little bit of the science behind wallpapers, we can think about hanging them. But before we do that, we have to cut our lengths so that they accurately pattern match for when they're fitted next to each other on the wall. Understanding the symbols supplied by the manufacturers will help us to identify where the pattern match and pattern repeat is. And it is in this section that we'll explore them, along with the other symbols you will commonly find on a wallpaper label. Now the pattern match, pattern repeat helps us in particular at the hanging stage because that tells us where to join each piece up. 
and that of course has to be accounted for as we cut our lengths. Generally a symbol is in two parts, normally identifying the pattern repeat, the distance that any given part of the design repeats itself, and of course the match, such as straight, half drop, etc. So if for example, as we have here, we have a 52 centimetre straight match, what that's telling us is that the distance is 52 centimetres before that part of the design repeats itself. In effect, we cut our length of paper accounting for the height of the wall, plus five centimetres top and bottom for trim waste, plus the stated pattern repeat. And for the match, you'd look horizontally across the paper or straight across to find the balance of the design that we'll use to join the next length up. On a hard drop, again with the same repeat distance, it would be seen as this. The symbol telling us that the matching part is halfway between the repeat distance. Then there's the random, or free match as it's often referred. This symbol tells us that there is no match on the design and that one sheet can be hung in any position in relation to the previous one hung. This is used primarily on textured, striped or plain designs. The symbol for this is an arrow with a zero on the other side of a vertical line. Finally, there's the reverse hang. These two arrows, one pointing upwards and the other one down, means reverse hang alternate lengths. Again, this would be used on textured, planes or stripes. To hang these papers, it is best to pre-cut all your lengths before hanging and mark them up in the same place with something to identify the top of each sheet. In our case, we put a T. We then hang the first length, doing so with the marked end at the top of the wall. Our second length is hung upside down, with the symbol at the bottom of the wall. The third length, the symbol goes back to the top, and so on. Washability symbols tell us what we can expect from our papers from a care point of view. The first one is spongible, indicated by a single wavy line. Now this tells us that it will be possible to remove adhesive from the face of the paper without damaging the face of the paper, assuming we remove it whilst it's still wet. The washable symbol, indicated by two wavy lines, means that it can be reasonably expected to be able to remove light dirt or marks from a paper face, even after the paper is hung and dry. The super washable symbol, three wavy lines, suggests that it should be possible to remove slightly heavier domestic soiling than the previous one. Finally, there's the wavy line above a scrubbing brush. This almost exclusively applies to vinyl faced wall coverings as it suggests that heavy soiling may be removed with the use of a warm water detergent and the use of light scrubbing without damaging the face of the paper. Keying the wall, which is the process of rubbing a wall with grit light sandpaper, is actually quite important as it removes the little bits of sand like grit or splashes of paint from the wall surface. Whilst the wall may look smooth to the eye, these minuscule blemishes will show themselves as much larger lumps once the paper has been applied to the wall and dried out. The reason we tend not to see them on first hanging the paper is because the tiny bits of grit is camouflaged by the layer of adhesive sandwiched between the paper and the wall. It's not until the adhesive dries out and the paper is pulled tight against the wall that it'll show. And it's this that we see as a magnified blemish. So now we have beautifully smooth walls. So now we have to think about the time-honoured practice of sizing a wall. Sizing is an historic practice of taking a heavily diluted wallpaper adhesive and applying it to the wall prior to our lining paper or wallpaper being hung. Traditionally, sizing was done simply to take the porosity out of a wall, because in days gone by, all walls were thick heavy layers of plaster which was particularly porous. 
So looking at it logically, if a wall has been previously wallpapered, or if it's been painted with emulsion, these chambers must already be full. Assuming this to be the case, this weak layer of size adhesive will simply lie on the wall surface, acting like a thin layer of grease, which becomes a hindrance rather than a help, as it stops the much stronger adhesive that's on the back of the wallpaper from doing its job. Additionally, the old practice of painting a wall with an emulsion, which acted in a similar way as the size, is now also to be discouraged. Modern paints, including emulsions, which were traditionally chalk-based, now have vinyl polymers in them, which are specifically designed to make the paint washable. The purpose of these polymers is to stop anything sticking to the wall, which is, of course, exactly what we are trying to do with our wallpaper adhesive. Where a wall is painted, then heavy sanding is recommended to create a key for the adhesive to lock into. There are generally two points of view when it comes to cross-lining a wall, those that believe it should always be done and of course those that don't. That belief is generally influenced by one of two things, either that the wall is already painted and is particularly smooth, or that the customer, the end user, ultimately can't afford the additional cost of that extra process. Whatever point of view is held, what cannot be disputed is that technically speaking, lining paper is without doubt the best surface you will hang wallpaper onto. Lining paper alone will significantly reduce the risk of one of the major problems associated with wallpapers, which is the opening up of the joints on the wallpaper drying out. This is where the wallpaper appears to have shrunk back, leaving a small gap of around one millimeter. The other notable benefit is that it covers up any color differences, such as patch plastering, pencil lines, paint, etc., which may show through non-woven papers in particular, as they're not always 100% opaque. If we were to look at the face of lining paper under magnification, we'd see that it's rough and fibrous in nature. This texture feels exactly the same as the roughness of the back of the wallpaper. When hanging lining paper, you do so horizontally and not vertically. The reason for this is because if we hang it horizontally on the wall, the expansion is vertical down the wall, which, when we then hang our paper vertically on top, which has its expansion horizontally, the two sheets' expansion effectively cancels each other out. You'll also note that we leave a gap of around one millimetre between each sheet of lining. This stops a ridge forming underneath the decorative wallpaper, as the lining paper isn't always perfectly trimmed. It's generally accepted that with adhesive application there are two ways to apply it. There is the traditional wide-headed brush and then there is the more modern long-haired emulsion type roller. Either is as good as each other and it really doesn't matter that much. What is important is less how you apply it but how much you apply. This picks up on the previous chapter where we explored how paper fibres work and their need to fill up with moisture. In practical terms, it is much more difficult to apply too much adhesive than it is to insufficiently apply. Over applying adhesive will do no more than leave an excess on the reverse of the paper which will, at worst, squeeze out at the edges to be cleaned up later. Under applying is much more of a potential problem. As we now know, paper fibres absorb moisture from the adhesive until they're full. If there is insufficient adhesive applied, then the fibres will steal all of the moisture and the adhesive will be tacky on the reverse of the paper when we come to hang it. Tacky adhesive means the paper has almost certainly expanded inconsistently and may well prove very difficult to hang. Once pasted, the paper should be folded, adhesive side in, taking it from one end of the sheet to the middle and the other end folded in to meet it. Then loosely roll to keep the moisture locked in whilst it's absorbed into the paper. The recommended soaking period is indicated on the back of the roll label and is generally between five to eight minutes. You'll know you've applied the right amount if, when you open up the paper after its soak period, the adhesive is still rippling wet.
There are simply too many brands of adhesives to list here. However, the majority of them fall into one of two categories. The first, which is the flake powder type adhesives that comes in a packet and we identify by pouring it into a bucket of water, stirring it and allowing it to thicken before we use it. The second, and the one that we strongly recommend here at Anstey Wall Coverings, is the light ready mix tub adhesives, which you buy ready to use in a tub. Now it might be believed that a tub adhesive is nothing more than a powder mix adhesive mixed down by the manufacturers, put into a tub and then sold for additional profit. This is very much not the case. A typical sachet adhesive would have a solid content of around 6%, the rest being water, whereas a tub adhesive would be near a 15% starch solids with around 2% additional ingredients, then the balance being water. Additionally, the tub adhesives are manufactured in such a way that not only is there more solids as a percentage, but the adhesive is significantly stronger in its composition on a like-for-like -like basis. They're significantly better at sticking to difficult surfaces, such as we increasingly find in modern times, such as painted walls, plastic panels and dry line plaster. OK, so how important is the soak time on conventional paper? Well, the soak time is the period of time it takes for our paper, assuming sufficient amount of adhesive has been applied, to go from its dry state to its fully expanded width. This, as previously mentioned, taking somewhere between five and eight minutes. The specific soak time is determined by the type of paper, how diluted the adhesive is, and of course how much has been applied to the back of the paper. We can now see the overall expansion by comparing an unpasted piece against a fully soaked out piece of paper. The minimum soak time is particularly important as it's better to allow paper to soak out longer than recommended rather than less. As long as the adhesive is still wet after opening it up, it'll be usable. The more adhesive applied to the paper, then the quicker the paper fibres can get at the available moisture. Conversely, insufficient adhesive extends the soak times. If the conventional paper is applied straight to the wall after pasting, without allowing it to soak, it will continue to expand and you will find you have some very large, elongated bubbles running down the length of the paper, or butt joints which are buckling up proud of the surface, or joints that overlap each other. Because the bubbles created in this scenario are expansion bubbles, the chances are that after the drying period, while some of them may reduce in size, they will not disappear. And this, unfortunately, is an irredeemable situation. On the other hand, paper that has been allowed to fully soak out will lie flat to the wall without any difficulty and stay flat for the whole drying period. Hanging wallpaper, assuming you've followed the simple rules as previously laid out, is a straightforward process, regardless of whether it's non-woven or conventional paper. When hanging conventional paper, pick up the wallpaper from one end, allow it to open up and take it to the wall. Gently slide the paper into a butt join. Note here how the paper is held away from the wall by all but 10 centimetres or so, as this allows simple manoeuvrability and easy positioning. Then allow the rest of the paper to fall down against the wall, ensure a tight butt join and smooth down the sheet from the centre with a wide paper hanger's brush or plastic smoothing tool to ensure any trapped air bubbles are removed. Non-wovens, unlike conventional paper, benefits from the ability to be hung straight from the roll if desired. Using a roller, generously paste the wall, pasting around 20 centimetres wider than the width of the paper ensuring that there are no dry patches on the wall. Draw the paper up the wall and smooth down as you would with conventional paper. If preferred, non-wovens can of course be pasted on the table in the conventional way. If this method is preferred, then there's no need for a soak time and the paper can be taken straight to the wall and hung. Wallpaper decoration is all about creating a neat finish. Therefore, one of the most important procedures when hanging is making sure it's neatly trimmed top and bottom. 
best advice is to use snap-off blades and a tool referred to as a steel. There are various versions of a steel, but essentially they're all generally made of metal and have a long straight edge to cut along. Ensuring the steel is applied into the join between the ceiling and the wall, apply pressure against the wallpaper only, holding it firmly against the wall. Paper is particularly good at blunting cutting blades, so snap off the blade regularly to expose a new piece every two or three lengths hung. Keeping the blade at a very shallow angle and maintaining pressure on the steel, draw the blade firmly across to create a single neat cut. Any attempt to cut paper without using a steel will lead to snagging and tearing, giving an unsightly finish. The alternative to this, particularly in difficult to access areas, is to tap the wallpaper into the join of the ceiling and wall to create a crease. Then mark the sheet all the way across with a pencil. Gently pulling the paper away, cut along the line with a pair of long decorator shears. Obstacles, such as light switches, can be tackled in one of two ways either by cutting in against the edge of the light plate using a blade and steel, or, for a neater finish, cut 5 to 10 millimeter flaps that are then tucked underneath the loosened switch plate. For a really professional finish, use the cutting in method when hanging the lining paper and the flap method when hanging the decorative wallpaper. But do remember that moisture and electricity don't mix well, so do isolate the power first. Let us look at some of the more common post-hanging queries relating to wallpaper. Remembering that none of the complaints identified here can be remedied after the event, it's therefore important to understand the causes and follow good practice to avoid them in the first instance. The major cause of colour fading on wallpaper is sunlight. Ultraviolet wavelengths in sunlight can attack the pigments used in printing inks. Fading of wallpaper is generally more common where it's subjected to continued exposure to sunlight. In the Northern Hemisphere, for example, this would be at a south-facing window. Interestingly, when printing inks are affected by sunlight, it's not necessarily the dark colours which fade first, but the lighter ones, such as pale yellows, pinks and greens, etc. This is because the darker the pigment used to make a colour, the more inherent UV protection it has within it. The paler the colour, the less natural protection, thus it fades easier. Paste attack is where the face of the paper looks as though it has been eaten away, giving the impression the paper has started to break up. Depending on the circumstances, it can show itself anything from a few months to as long as four or five years. Paste attack is a clear sign that wallpaper adhesive has been left on the surface of the paper, and this now dry adhesive fixes itself firmly to the face of the paper and flexes over time to the constant changes in room temperature and humidity. This flexing can lead to the coating of the paper cracking off, taking both the adhesive and the printing ink with it. It is therefore important that adhesive is diluted from the face of the paper with plenty of water at the hanging stage, whilst that adhesive is still wet. Adhesive should never be allowed to dry on the surface of a wall covering. Opened up joins, or shrink back gap, normally around one millimeter in width, is directly attributable to inappropriate preparation. As we now know, wallpaper expands when it's pasted with adhesive, and it will look to pull back to its original size as it starts to dry out. This process of shrinking back will happen if the adhesion is insufficient to hold the paper in its fully expanded state once it's been applied to the wall. Shrinkback can be singularly attributed to a number of factors, either inappropriate adhesive type, lack of wall preparation, excessive heat during the drying period, or a combination of these. 
The best advice we can offer to reduce the risk of shrink back is to use a suitably heavy adhesive such as the light ready mix type, cross line the wall and keep the room at a comfortable temperature for the duration of the drying period. This drying period may be as low as 24 hours for paper to as much as 5-6 to six days for a vinyl wall covering. Joins which have overlapped or buckled up proud of the surface will have been caused by the paper continuing to expand after it has been applied to the wall. Wallpaper will only expand a fixed amount before it stabilises. Therefore, this would suggest that the soak time was not adhered to and the paper had been applied to the wall before it had finished its expansion. Peeling paper, where paper curls away from the wall, is generally attributable to a heat source and in this case to the heat generated behind the radiator. All starch based adhesives, but particularly the powder type, break down after a period of time if subjected to heat. In the case of severe heat behind a radiator, this breaking down can sometimes be only a matter of weeks, particularly so if a poor quality adhesive has been used. Whilst there can be no guarantee that wallpaper won't peel away under these extreme circumstances, we can do things that will reduce the possibility or the severity of it happening. Firstly, if possible, remove the radiators and ensure that the wall is papered with complete lengths rather than the method of tucking pieces behind the radiator that's been left in situ. Secondly, apply either a PVA adhesive or a heavy contract grade adhesive direct to the wall just prior to hanging. This will then blend in with the adhesive that's on the back of the paper creating a much stronger bond. However, do not use a PVA or a heavy contract adhesive directly on the back of the wallpaper as this will cause difficulties with the paper itself. Finally, to allow the paper to fully dry out naturally, turn the radiators off. There are two likely causes for shiny patches. It may be that the joins have been excessively rubbed, particularly at the edges, with a dry cloth, effectively buffing the face of the paper and making it appear shiny. More likely though, it is adhesive that's been left on the face of the paper that has been allowed to dry out. The shiny effect is particularly noticeable if you view the wall at a tight angle into a light source such as a window. Alternatively, it'll be seen as shiny smears across the paper face, which would indicate that the water used for washing down was contaminated with adhesive. As well as being unsightly, it could ultimately lead to paste attack, as previously explained. Make sure that you regularly change the water in a bucket to avoid this happening. Mould is a natural spore that can develop if it's exposed to two critical elements, water and something organic to feed on. With wallpaper of course we have both of these in abundance and if allowed to do so mould will flourish. In particular mould is often seen around cold drafty windows where there's condensation or poorly ventilated rooms like bathrooms and kitchens. Any wall that shows evidence of having a damp problem, for whatever reason, needs to be remedied at source before you start decorating. The walls must then be allowed to fully dry out before that decoration can proceed. Generally, all but the very specialist of adhesives will have fungicide protection in them. However, its content is limited as it's intended to protect the adhesive whilst it's stored in the tub, extending only to cover the drying period once the paper's been hung. Any surface that's been previously contaminated with mould should be treated separately with a commercially available fungicidal wash. There may well be other questions you are asked by your client, but these are the main issues which arise time and again. 
Hopefully, by knowing the reasons why they occur, you will be able to maintain a good relationship with your client. However, remember that the most important thing to any wallpaper decoration is preparation, preparation, preparation. Well, that's it. We hope you've enjoyed the masterclass in wallpaper decoration and we hope you've enjoyed the film. If you do require additional information, then please do visit the websites. In the meantime, good luck, thank you very much, and happy decorating.